All right, take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I want to summarize where we are in the Gospel of John, and then I want to summarize a few things in regards to the state of Christianity in our world today. A few weeks ago, we entered the narrative, so to speak, and we looked at the humility of John the Baptist. He is not seeking to promote himself. He's not trying to become a preacher of prestige. He is trying to deflect and direct all attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Pharisees know John the Baptist to be a mighty prophet and the greatest preacher the world has seen in 400 years. But John the Baptist says, I'm just a voice. Prepare the way for the Messiah. He knows his role and in his humility, he manifests the hallmarks of a faithful witness of Jesus. He doesn't say, make much of me. He says, make less of me. He doesn't say, I must increase. He says, he must increase and I must decrease. Then we looked two weeks ago at John's stunning statement in John 129. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In John chapter one, there are 51 verses and there are at least eight different names or titles by which Jesus is called. In the opening verse, we read that he is the Logos. He is the power and creator behind the universe. We read that he is the light. We read that Jesus is the son of God. We then read in John one that the first disciples call him rabbi. Then they call him Christ. We have found the Christ, they say. Then Nathaniel says, you're the king of Israel. And then in verse 51, Jesus refers to himself as the son of man. But none of these titles are more precious than the one John identifies Jesus by, and that is the lamb of God. Jesus is the long awaited, final substitutionary lamb that would die in the place of sinners and absorb the wrath of God and bear the punishment that is necessary for you and I to have peace with God. One thing to keep in mind is that everything that we read in John 1 verses 19 through chapter 2 verse 11 all happens within this opening week of Jesus's ministry. In other gospels we read that he was baptized by John the Baptist, then he is Really, he goes off into the wilderness where he is tempted by the devil for 40 days. He then comes out of the wilderness and it's at that time that John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Again, in John 1, 36, John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb of God. Our section for this morning is in verses 37 through 43 and we're gonna finish chapter one next week and then we'll pick up in chapter two after Easter, but let me read verses 37 through 43. And we're gonna look at one central idea, the last two words of 43 this morning. Verse 37, the two disciples heard him speak, that's John the Baptist, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. If I were to ask you, how would you define a Christian? What would you say? If someone asked you in an elevator or an escalator or at li in line at a grocery store, what is a Christian? How would you respond? The word Christian is interesting. Nowhere in all of the gospels does Jesus ever refer to his disciples or the people that follow him as Christians. He refers to them as his followers or as disciples, as I have just mentioned. The first time we read the word Christians is in Acts eleven twenty six, 26. And it is being used almost pejoratively as a slur and a slander on those who belong to Jesus Christ. It says that the disciples were for, first called Christians in Antioch. A Christian was something that they were called by the watching unsaved world. It's not something they initially called themselves. It says in Acts 26, verse 28, King Agrippa mockingly asks Paul, are you trying to persuade me to be a Christian? So again, this is not something they called themselves. They were known as disciples and followers as we're gonna look at in greater detail in a moment. Over time, especially in the first century church, they begin to own this terminology. 
because you're a Christian, you belong to Jesus Christ. And over time they went, yes, that's exactly who we are. We do belong to Jesus Christ. He is our master and we are his slaves. Initially in the book of Acts, the followers of Jesus were identified by those who belonged, watch this and you're gonna see this over and over again, belong to the way. In Acts 9, verses one and two, it says, now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. In Acts 24, 22, Paul is giving testimony before Felix. And it says there, but Felix, having quite accurate knowledge about, in, in capital letters, the way. Presumably, the early church referred to themselves as followers of the way because Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In 2 Peter 2, 2, Peter refers to Christianity as the way of truth. Today, according to Pew Research, 63% of people in our country identify as Christian. 63%, that's down from 90% in the early 1990s. But still, nearly 2.4 billion people around the world identify as a Christian. That's one third of the world's population. However, as I mentioned to you, the term Christian is only used three times in the New Testament. But in contrast to that, the term disciple is used 268 times because it accurately conveys what are the expectations and assumptions of someone who says, I belong to Jesus. My question for you this morning is what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Jesus says in 143, follow me. And I'm gonna go into great detail on what that means this morning. There are many today that say you do not have to be a disciple to be a Christian and assert that disciple is this second tier for serious try-harders who want to be on this accelerated and aggressive track of Christendom. This, however, is wildly incongruous with what we read in the pages of scripture and from Jesus's very mouth. In the past, I have read some statistics that display the theological temperature of the church in our country. And in doing so, we may shake our heads at the church world out there and fail to realize that there are likely dozens upon dozens of people in here this morning that have not heard, do not understand, or may have forgotten what it means to be a disciple or a follower of Jesus Christ. What we're gonna look at today is it's gonna help you to realize it makes sense when we read in Matthew 7, many, many are going to say, Lord, Lord. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. The average person in America and the average person in Franklin, Tennessee, possess an altogether anemic, deficient, and potentially damning understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I remember I told you that when I was in junior high or really right before junior high, I moved from Chicago to California. I didn't really know what to do with all my time. So I went to Costco and I bought a Jasmine by Takamini guitar. I had this Romanian guy who was willing to give me lessons and uh, he was a classical guitarist, but you know, he said, what two songs do you wanna play? And I had two very simple answers. Number one, Dust in the Wind. Teach me how to play that right now. <laughs> Number two, I want to know how to play the number one hit Christian song, What If I Stumble by DC Talk. At the beginning of that song by DC Talk, there is a quote that has always struck me. It says there at the beginning of the song, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Since World War II, the gospel has been presented in a way wherein you could be a Christian without becoming a disciple. But is that the truth? The text says in John 137 that they followed Jesus. And then later on in 143, Jesus says, follow me. But what does that mean? D.A. Carson says it simply, in the fourth gospel, that's the gospel of John, the verb to follow means to follow as a disciple. 
In John chapter eight, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He says in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. John 12, 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. I want you to understand that Jesus never encouraged anybody to pray a prayer. He never said sign on the dotted line. He tells people then and he tells people now, follow me. I want you to notice the language that describes the early church. It says in Acts 6, and the word of God continued to increase and the number of disciples, not converts, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. That's just everyone. When you think of disciples, sometimes you think about the 12. Every single person that was coming to saving faith in Jesus Christ was identified as a disciple. It says the number of disciples were multiplying greatly. It says in Acts 9, verse one, but Paul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. In Acts 9, 19, for some days, Paul was with the disciples at Damascus. It says, and in Antioch, Acts 11, the disciples were first called Christians. I wanna consider what that means this morning. What is a disciple? What does it mean to follow Jesus Christ? And to really organize our time, I wanna give you seven truths this morning. Seven truths about what it means to follow Jesus. This isn't for someone else. This is for my own heart and for your own heart as well. Seven truths about what it means when Jesus says to you through his living word, follow me. The first of which, to follow Jesus Christ is to believe and receive Jesus and his word. Jesus says in John 1 follow me. And first and fundamentally to follow Jesus Christ is to receive the word of Jesus Christ because you believe in him. It says in John 1 12, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. In John 6, 29, Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. We become followers through faith in Jesus Christ and faith comes by hearing, responding and receiving the word of God. That's what it says in Romans 10, 17. No one is saved by a whisper in the wind. No one has communicated the gospel by sh the rustling of the branches. No one also sees someone acting Christian and knows how to respond to the gospel in faith. Faith is always, always the response to believing in the word of God. That's either through the reading of scripture or the communicating of the truth of scripture through disciples of Jesus Christ. So this is first and foremost, to follow Jesus is to believe and receive Jesus in his word. But I wanna go into greater detail than just that because I think we're all on the same page there in many respects. But secondly here, to follow Jesus means to abide in Jesus Christ. Turn over to John chapter 15 and we'll be here for a few minutes. John chapter 15. And I want you to, note, I want you to notice a reoccurring word here. John 15 verses one through 11. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept the father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. A follower of Jesus Christ is not a visitor or a stranger to fellowship with Jesus. The word abide appears 10 times in verses four through 11. It's the Greek word meno. It's used 42 times in the gospel of John and it describes the relationship that a true follower has with the true vine and that is to remain rooted, to abide to stay with. 
following Jesus is not just a momentary decision. It is a continuous belief and sustained relationship with Jesus Christ. In classical Greek, a disciple referred to someone who devoted his life to something. He was all chips in. Oftentimes, the same idea of discipleship is conveyed of an apprentice who is learning a craft from a tradesman. These relationships are binding and they, it was represented by a healthy loyalty and commitment on the part of the disciple to the master teacher. And it always, always, always implied personal attachment. It's not just a lifetime commitment because we could say that our life is devoted to Jesus Christ. It was a daily commitment where your life commit, commitment was manifested by the way that you lived each and every single day. Here's one of the things that even you need to understand. When Jesus sees a massive crowd, in John 6, it's not like he is going, all right, I like how things are going. Peter, James, John, fist bumps all around. Look at the crew that is now following us. When Jesus sees a crowd, he gets concerned because he is beginning to doubt that they have really, truly understood the expectations and assumptions of someone who is going to abide in Jesus Christ. So in John chapter 6, it says in verse 66, after Jesus has some hard words, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. They left. They did not remain. They did not abide. True disciples and true followers of Jesus Christ do not make a profession and then maybe leave or neither do they just visit. They abide. They remain. This isn't helpful to understand because Jesus says, I am the vine he says, you are the branches, but the reality is there are false branches in every single church, including ours. There are husbands who are only here this morning because their wives drag them. There are wives that only come because their husbands beg them. There are families that are here because that's what culture in the South expects of them. And there are young people who are only here because their parents make them. But these are false branches no true connection to the vine. Because Jesus says, if you're a true follower, you abide in Jesus. You love to be with Jesus. Maybe you're asking, how do I abide? Well, that brings me to my third point. True followers of Jesus Christ, listen and obey the voice of their shepherd. Turn over to John chapter 10 for a minute. John chapter 10. And you're going to see this language over and over again throughout John's gospel. John chapter 10, verse 3. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. John chapter 10, verse 16. Look with me there. Jesus says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Look over with me at verse 27 of the same chapter. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. A Christian is someone who abides in Jesus Christ and the way that they abide in Jesus Christ and remain rooted in his love is because they stay attuned to his voice as the shepherd speaks to his sheep through his word. This is a question for every single human heart in here this morning that claims Christ. Do you listen to the voice of Jesus? And does he lead you through his word? Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. Do you? Do you hear the voice of your shepherd? This is part and parcel of what it means to be a disciple. The word disciple in Greek is mathetes. And in every situation, there is a disciple, there is a teacher. They're always linked. And this process involves a corresponding personal relationship and a desire to continue to hear the voice of your master. And so we ask this morning, if you claim to be a follower of Christ, do you hear your shepherd's voice? John 10, 27 again, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. This wasn't once upon a time. This is a momentary daily dependence upon the voice of our shepherd to lead us. In this 15th chapter, again, look back with me at John 15. Number four here, a true follower of Christ is someone who bears the fruit of righteousness, who bears the fruit of righteousness. 
In John 15, we already read it, but it says this in verse two, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Verse four, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse six, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. You know, one of the things I'm increasingly afraid of is that there is an entire generation of professing Christians who have grown up hearing that it's legalistic to think that Jesus expects and assumes that those who abide in the vine are going to bear the fruit of righteousness. But this is part and parcel of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Don't take my word for it. Take Jesus's. We are not saved by our fruit, but the fruit of our faith goes to prove that the root of salvation has taken place in our heart. Verse eight, again, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Here's just the plain reading of the scripture. Jesus says, if there is no fruit, there is no proof. You're not saved by your fruit, but wherever the root of salvation has taken place, that'll manifest itself in the fruit of righteousness. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 16, again, if you're getting uneasy, just listen to the words of Jesus. Matthew 7, 16, you will know them by their fruits. Jesus says, grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? I'm not a farmer, to be honest. I buy my food at the grocery store, Costco, but even I understand this. Jesus says, hey, you don't find bananas on an apple tree, do you? No, you don't. Everybody understands that. And he says, so neither are figs gathered from thistles. Every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, watch this, you will know them by their fruits. So many people are scared of distorting the gospel that they've ended up massively distorting the gospel. We are saved by grace, but wherever grace has taken root in our hearts, it'll manifest itself with an increasing, not perfect, an increasing trajectory towards Christ-likeness. Why? Because that's the will of God for your life, to become more like Jesus. Do you wanna know one of the chief reasons God saved you and one of the material ways you bring him glory? Well, it says in verse eight, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. Look with me at John 15, verse 16. Why did Jesus choose us? Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. Do you see that word that in verse 16? It says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. You see that word that? Circle that word. That's called a henna clause in the Greek. And it describes the purpose, intention, design behind what was just said. It explains the why for the what that preceded it. And the what is that Jesus chose you out of a world of darkness. Why? It says here that you would go and bear fruit. I don't know if you've ever thought about God's will for your life this way, but God's will for your life is to bring him glory. And it says in verse eight, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Number five, true followers of Jesus Christ abandon their life. Again, what are we talking about right now? We're talking about Jesus says very simply and very succinctly in John 1 follow me. And what I want you to do is write a question mark next to follow me and ask the question, what does that even mean? And that's what we're answering this morning. Because fifth here, to follow Jesus Christ means to abandon your life. Turn over to John chapter 12. And we're gonna look to the synoptic gospels to see how Jesus defines us in the rest of the gospels. But in John chapter 12, verse 25, Jesus says this, he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. I mean, that's the words of Jesus. He who loves his life loses it. 
and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. This is the opposite of a PR move. This is not a sales pitch. I told you before I moved here, I used to be on like the evangelistic kind of, I would go and preach at conferences and there were these things called commitment cards. And whenever people got saved, they were to kind of fill out this card. And afterwards we would fill them out and see how many people gave their life to Jesus Christ. I understand the intention behind that. Um, And I do have no problem urging someone to repent right now. I'm not saying, hey, go think about this. Go talk to your wife about it. If I'm giving the gospel somewhere, I'm saying, hey, don't walk out this door if you don't know where your eternal soul is going to rest. It's going to one of two places, heaven with Jesus Christ or eternal hell and damnation. Don't leave. Don't sleep another night. I have no problem urging someone to be reconciled to God because part of being a kingdom ambassador in 2 Corinthians 5 is that I plead with people, implore people, beg them on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. But with that being said, Jesus is never trying to cloak, camouflage, or disguise the real cost of following him. Sometimes people, you know, you'll see, yeah, 8,000 people gave their life to Jesus Christ. I truly believe that in our world today, when Jesus reads that, he gets concerned. Because I'm wondering how many of them were told that when they signed up to follow Jesus Christ, it meant abandonment of this life. They're not trying to add Jesus to their life. He becomes their entire life. Very few Christians know that the way to find life is to lose it. We tend to do the opposite of what Jesus says, preserve, protect, progress, settle, 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 settle. We live our whole lives as if this is eternal life. But there is a divine paradox here. Turn over with me to Mark chapter one for a moment, Mark one. And we're gonna read kind of in greater detail some of the narrative that encapsulates even Jesus' imperative to follow him. Mark chapter one, John the Baptist shows up on the scene and then Jesus shows up on the scene. In verse 16 of Mark one, and he, that's Jesus, was going along by the sea of Galilee and he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of of Simon, casting a net in the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. Sometimes we have this idea that these disciples were these poor, deranged fishermen. I want you to understand that these disciples were very, very successful. They have hired servants. They owned a boat. They're successful. They're at least second generation fishermen because they're working with their father. They're doing well. It's not like they had nothing else to do. Jesus says, follow me. And they drop their nets and follow him. What does that mean? It means that they were abandoning their source of security, their source of income and their source of identity and finding a new identity and following Jesus Christ. They don't say, actually, Jesus, I'm gonna do this and kind of do this. And I'm gonna kind of appendage you onto my lifestyle. They dropped their nets to follow Jesus Christ. Can I just ask you, as I've asked my own heart this week, have you ever left anything to follow Jesus? I'm not trying to be dogmatic. I'm not trying to be hard. I think with necessary tenderness and pastoral love, I wanna just ask you, have you ever left anything to follow Jesus? Matthew 13, says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from the joy over it goes and sells, watch this, everything he has and buys that field. What's the kingdom of heaven like? Well, let me just give you the analogy. Jesus says, it's like a field, uh, Lewisburg, Tennessee. There's 10 acres for sale. This guy walks out into the field. There's literally Indiana Jones type of treasure in that field. He's gonna go home and he's not trying to go, well, I'm gonna sell like, some of the old clothes they don't wear on eBay. No, he sells everything so that he can buy that which is far more valuable, a far superior treasure. And Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's someone who understands that this is so much more valuable so they abandon everything, give up everything to follow Jesus. The door is indeed broad 
to salvation. What I mean by that is that Jesus says, whosoever comes, whosoever believes, whosoever thirsts, whosoever hungers, come here, come here, come here. He's inviting everybody. There's no footnote associated with the word whosoever. But even though the door is broad, we would say that the way is what? Narrow. Because Jesus is not selling discipleship. He does want all men to come to repentance. He is an eager savior. He does not delight in the punishment of the wicked, but he is never trying to masquerade what is truly expected of someone who truly follows him. Turn over to Luke 14 for a minute. I just wanna show you how Jesus preaches. And I want you to imagine, how big would Jesus's church be in Franklin, Tennessee? Because I'm not sure people are gonna like what he has to say. Luke 14. Now, again, there's large crowds. We're going along. Verse 25, with him. This is not something that fires him up. This is something that concerns him. He wants to make sure they understand what it means to follow him. It says they were going along with him. And he turned and said to them, verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He's not literally saying go home and hate Stephanie. What he is saying is in comparison with the love that you have for Jesus Christ, nothing in this world even compares. Your life is so now hemmed into a desire to follow Jesus Christ that you could even say you hate your own life because... Your life has been wrapped up in Christ. Verse 27, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000 or else while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciples who does not give up, keyword, all his possessions. My sister and brother-in-law are missionaries in Albania. I've told you that before. Uh, They say in the early 90s when communism fell that you could count the amount of Christians in Albania on one hand. It borders the Mediterranean Sea, and then you have Kosovo and Montenegro to the north, and then Greece to the south. In Albania, there are hundreds, I mean hundreds of half-finished houses. It's amazing. You drive along the road and you see houses with a foundation, with walls, with a roof, but there's no windows and there's no one living inside. I always wondered why. And so I texted my sister on Thursday, why are there all those houses? I mean, dozens, hundreds of these houses. Why are there all these houses that are almost finished, but not finished? And my sister said, it's really simple. They just don't budget. They run out of money before they finish the house. They don't count the cost. They get into it thinking it would be one thing. And when they realize the true cost, they abandon the endeavor altogether. Jesus says the same is true of those who claim to be his followers. Verse 28, which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Many people don't calculate the cost of following Jesus. They were just urged and exhorted, your best life now, your best life now. Jesus says, oh, I don't know about that. It's gonna cost you everything. John Stott wrote in his helpful little book, Basic Christianity, quote, the Christian landscape is strewn with the wreckage of derelict half-built towers, the ruins of those who begin to build and were unable to finish. For thousands of people still ignore Christ's warning and undertake to follow him without first pausing to reflect on the cost of doing so. The result is the great scandal of Christendom today, so-called nominal Christianity. 
In countries to which Christian civilization has spread, large numbers of people have covered themselves with a decent but thin veneer of Christianity. They have allowed themselves to become somewhat involved, enough to be respectable, but not enough to be uncomfortable. Their religion is a great, soft cushion. It protects them from hard unpleasantness of life while changing its place and shape to suit their own convenience. No wonder the cynics speak of hypocrites in the church and dismiss religion as escapism. How do we count the cost of following Jesus Christ? How do we count the cost? Surely not everybody pays the same price for following Jesus Christ. So how do we count the, the cost of following Jesus? What's the answer? By expecting Jesus to demand the highest possible cost. Piper says, if you do this, then nothing will surprise you. When you have signed up for the possibility of death and dereliction because you belong to him, Jesus is not saying, join me on my pathway to prominence. He is saying, join me on my way to the cross. So many people want to hang on to their life as they add Jesus, but Jesus says in Luke 14, 33, any one of you who does not renounce all that you have cannot be my disciple. Your resources, this is an endorsement for socialism. Your re resources are yours to steward in this life, but you need to understand they do not belong to you and neither does your life. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, everything you have belongs to Jesus. Contemporary church culture wants to make the pathway to discipleship as easy as possible, but Jesus says, have you? Has anyone ever asked you? Have you ever counted the cost? I'm afraid that the vast majority of professing evangelicalism today have not counted the cost of following Jesus Christ because they're not even aware there is one. They have heard that the gospel is a free gift, which it is, amen, but it will cost you everything. And in losing your life, Jesus says, you gain everything in Christ. Jesus is going to say the same thing in Luke 9, 23. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he's the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? In Mark 8, 34, Jesus is going to say again, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up the cross. Mark 10, 21, Jesus looked at the rich young ruler and said, one thing you lack, go and sell everything you possess and you shall have treasure in heaven. Matthew 10, 38, and the one who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Can I just ask you, in the plain reading of scripture, do you think the vast majority of America has any idea what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Can I also just ask you, why would anyone ever wanna mask what Jesus expects and assumes of those who follow him? Why would you wanna make it seem anything less than how our savior himself articulates and defines discipleship. You know, sometimes people ask each other, you know, oh, your friend, you're gonna see him at Thanksgiving, your brother, your sister, do they know the Lord? And people will say, you know, ah, you know I don't, I'm not sure, I think so, maybe not, they don't, don't do this, and I think they believe in Christ. The way you need to ascertain or begin to think through their eternal welfare is not whether they believe in a higher deity, but whether or not they have abandoned themselves to follow Jesus Christ. That's a different way of thinking about it. But for the person who claims Christ, there is no confidence that they belong to Christ unless they have denied this life and say, I'm all chips in for my savior. Again, this isn't a hot take. There's a reason I'm just going boom, boom, Mark 8, Mark 10, Matthew 10, Luke 9, Luke 14, because who's speaking? Jesus. Jesus says, death to self and potential death for my sake is what I expect. Can I tell you something with the authority of God's word? Do not think that following Jesus Christ is anything less than total abandonment of this life. C.S. Lewis says, Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you no half measures are any good. Hand over the whole natural self. I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own shall become yours.
Can I ask you, have you abandoned your life to follow Jesus? I'm convicted as our church grows, which is a good thing. We need to take some pulse checks. What is a Christian? You can be in the church your entire life and not understand at its very root level what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus defines it, he says, it's those who pick up a cross. Number six, to follow Jesus Christ means that you love other followers of Jesus Christ. We talked about this in greater detail last month, so I don't need to go any further than to say in John 13, 35, Jesus says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you did not sign up for a lone ranger life. You signed up to love the people of God. There's a reason, even in my own heart. I mean, I was gone last week. I'll tell you this, I, I don't look forward to leaving. I don't wanna leave more and more. I, I wanna say no to things. I wanna be here. I wanna be with my church family. I wanna love the people of God that God has put in my context, in my life, because I love the people of God. That's not a pat on the shoulder. That's just a reality. I wanna love, I wanna love the people that Jesus has put in my life because Jesus says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. One of the billboards to the watching world is we love each other. And that's what it means to follow Christ. Number seven, number seven, to follow Jesus Christ. And sometimes we can miss the forest for the trees is to love the one you follow. Turn over to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. John 14, verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words and the words which you, you hear is not mine but the fathers who sent me. John 14, 28. You heard that I said to you, I go away, that I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. John 15, verses nine and 10. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. The final conversation of John's gospel is Jesus' breakfast conversation with Peter. And he doesn't ask him anything other than this simple question. Do you love Jesus Christ? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And he says, yes, you know I love you. And he says, no, do you really love me? Thrice, he drives home the question. He's asking every single kid in here, boys and girls, you may grow up in the church. He's not asking you if you know the answers. He's asking you, Young man, young woman, old man, old woman, do you love me? This is the most basic part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You abandon your life because you love him and desire to follow him. Do you love Jesus? Not the idea of Jesus, not the benefits of Jesus, not the promises of Jesus, do you love the person of Jesus Christ? It means to love him. To follow him and to love him are the same thing. We sang this morning, wonderful, merciful savior, precious redeemer, and what? Friend. Do you know Jesus Christ like a friend? Can you say that of your life? So often in parenting, we even think about communicating biblical principles without articulating and expressing that the whole crux of our faith is fellowship and affection with a person that is our friend. Finally here, what's the promise that Jesus makes to his followers? He says, give up your life. He says, deny yourself, pick up your cross. But he doesn't do so in a vacuum. He makes profound promises to those who follow him. What are those promises? Well, number one, he promises eternal life. The antidote to defection, one commentary says, is the promise of eternal life. The word zoe appears 56 times in John's gospel. It means life. 
And only three of the 56 times that word appears in John's gospel does it refer to physical life. 53 of the 56, it refers to this eternal life that Jesus offers to those who believe and follow him. What is eternal life? Well, we'll get into this in later chapters, but it's not just living forever. It's experienced in the here and now. Jesus says in John 17, three, this is eternal life that you may know God. That begins now. Not only does Jesus promise eternal life, it says in John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill and steal and destroy, but I have come to give you life and life. Anybody know? Abundantly or to the fullest, to the max. Meaning everybody else that doesn't follow Jesus Christ, they're breathing, they're existing, but they're not living because the second you understand what it means to abandon your life, only then and only then, only then will you have any concept of what it means to experience abundant life. Because the reason John says he must increase, I must decrease, is that the more Jesus Christ increases, the more we decrease, the more we experience life with a capital L. Abundant life is to be the friend of Christ. Jesus says in John 15, 15, no longer do I call you slaves, but friends. In John 20, verse 17, he calls us brothers. In John 21, verse five, he calls us friends. To follow Jesus is to be loved by Jesus, to be known and to know God. And then just, as I wrap, and this is where we're gonna spend our time next week. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you need to understand this, means that you are a disciple maker. So often we think that our job is just to come and sit and learn, but to be a disciple is to be a disciple maker. That's why Spurgeon says every single Christian is a missionary or an imposter. I I had them print off these cards this week for Easter Sunday. And it's partly because this, is, this has got to be the lowest hanging fruit thing. I, I'm not very practical all the time, but I want to be really practical right now. I'm working on it. This ought to be the lowest hanging fruit in your family. Who are we going to bring to come here about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? If you don't have someone you know that needs the Savior, that's a problem. That is a problem because you are here as light in the darkness. You're a kingdom ambassador. We printed off 2,000 of these. I'll do nine services. I don't care. You're a disciple maker. That's what you are. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you understand other people need to know him. Amen? And so invite a friend, invite a neighbor, be praying about that as a family. Who can we invite or as a single person? Can you say in your heart the words of the song, I decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, the world behind me, the cross before me, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. If you haven't done that, I pray you do so before you walk out of this church this morning. It'll cost you everything, but you'll receive everything you need in Christ, including eternal life and glory and abundant life in the here and now. Would you stand with me as I pray and conclude our time? You've been so patient. I wanna pray for us and then we'll pick this up next week and finish chapter one. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We're thankful for the clarity that even the gospel provides for us as we look at the entirety of what's within your word. A.W. Tozer says it makes, or takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. And so we read these simple words in 143, follow me. And we are forced to ask the question, what does that mean this morning? What does it mean for our life? Well, we know that it means to believe in Jesus, to abide in Jesus, to bear the fruit of righteousness because we have been abiding in Jesus. It means to abandon our life and attach our life to the one that saved us. God, would you make that true of our life? Lord, we confess, I confess, that does not perfectly describe anyone in here. But we know, Lord, that you call us to that standard and we are enabled through your spirit to obey you. Lord, we know that you have chose us to bear the fruit of righteousness. So would that be our heart's desire this week? You say that, that we prove to be your disciples when we bear fruit. Lord, make that the longing of our heart. Would we be able to pray, God, help me to bear fruit that you may be glorified and so that I may prove to the watching world I follow Jesus. Even in our vernacular, in a state, in a town in particular where almost everyone identifies as Christian, would there be something unique about our life? 
our daily habit of picking up our cross and following you. Lord, we love you and we're so grateful that you love us. We pray this in your name. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, before you leave, find someone, greet them, and we'll see you next Sunday. You're dismissed.